All right. Uh, again, you have these really fancy sense.nano pens that you can use to write down all your questions. You remember to ask them uh, when the panelists come back up. Uh, I would like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor JJ Hu uh, from Material Science and Engineering. Um, his focus is in understanding how to develop mechanically flexible photonic sensors as one of the many examples of uh, photon matter interactions that he's working on. Please take over. Yeah, thank, you. thank you so much for the introduction. Okay, so as you can see here today, uh, my topic will be on optical sensing. So speaking of that, that what will probably come to your mind is some geeky scientist sitting in a completely dark optics lab, playing around with all these laser beams. So while this makes perfect journal cover images, this is actually not what I'll be talking about today. Instead, my topic today will be on integrated photonics. And the idea is to actually replace all these discrete optical components that you place and carefully align to each other on optical bench with nano-fabricated counterparts that can be integrated on a small structure. <laughs> so by using this kind of photon integration technology, we are able to demonstrate what we call the optics lab on a chip systems that can perform the same sensing function as the bench top sensing systems, and in many cases, with even better performance. So just to give you an idea what this sensing system can do, I will give you a couple of examples of ongoing sensing research in my group. So first of all, we have demonstrated actually a chip scale optical spectrometer in the infrared range that allows us to acquire infrared spectrums of molecules that come into contact with the surface of the chemical chip. So by actually recording the infrared absorption spectrum and then comparing these infrared fingerprints or signatures with the existing library, we were able to precisely identify what are the species that's present and also quantify their concentration. So my student, Derek Kita, actually is going to give a poster later today and we will provide more details about the spectrometer work that we're working on right now. Now, in this second example here, I will discuss that some of these integrated photonic sensors can also function in environments that can be difficult or even hostile for conventional electronic sensors. So one such example is that we are developing sensors to work with transformers. Uh, this is actually not the kind of transformer I will be talking about here. So in fact, this is a project in collaboration with the China State Grid, and we would like to actually work with this kind of high voltage transformer facilities. And the challenge there is that there's always a lot of uh, electromagnetic radiations in the environment. So this will actually disrupt operation of conventional electronic sensors. On the other hand, we have an optical sensor chip that can be remotely interrogated using optical fibers. So this approach is inherently immune to any kind of electromagnetic interference. So I hope I show you that we can actually operate the sensors in some of these more extreme environments. Now coming back here, for the main topic of today, I'm actually discussing how we can also apply the sensors for applications such as uh, physiological sensing for human beings. Now in order to do that, that's actually a primary difficulty we have to overcome. If you look at all these integrated photonic sensors, they're mostly fabricated on a substrate like silicon, which is rigid and planar. Now as human beings, we are this kind of soft, I mean mechanically, and also deformable creature, such that there is actually this inherent mismatch in terms of geometric and elastic properties of sensing systems with the uh, biological tissues we try to interrogate. So this is what actually motivates the research that we want to develop mechanically compliant and flexible photonic systems that can be seamlessly integrated with biological tissues, such as human skin, for continuous physiological monitoring. Now in this slide here, I'm summarizing some of the key criteria we have to satisfy for this kind of systems. So first of all, they need to be bendable and stretchable to be uh, seamlessly integrated with biological tissues. In terms of optical properties, they need to exhibit low optical loss and that helps us to achieve high detection sensitivity. They also have to be single mode. What that means is that there can only exist one optical mode in these optical structures. And if there are actually more than one optical mode, what's gonna happen is that each of the modes will respond differently to the external perturbation, and that will make the interpretation of the data actually very challenging. Last but, last but not least, I also want to mention that we want to build not just one single device. To perform the sensing function, eventually what we will need is actually a full photonic circuit that goes from a light source, optical switch, passive devices like waveguide, and then detected from a photo detector. So one difficulty here is if you look at all these different components, they are all built out of these very distinctly different materials. And most of them actually turns out also to be uh, rigid, at least in their bulk form. 
So the challenge here is how we can actually integrate all these different materials together onto a flexible substrate and yet maintain the optical properties. So here I'll give you a couple of examples how we can actually construct these mechanically flexible systems and also how we can put these components together to form a functional photonic circuit. So first of all, I'll show you how we can actually construct this uh, flexible and stretchable photonic system. Uh, there are a couple of challenges here. One is that uh, if you want to make these devices on flexible substrates, in particular in here, is elastomers or rubbers. These rubber materials usually have very high coefficient of thermal expansion. That's one or two main order magnitude higher compared to conventional optical materials. So here, this class is actually what we build our photonic devices out of. And to actually mitigate this kind of big thermal stress, such that it causes a lot of cracking if you directly try to pattern materials on the rubber substrates, the idea we come up is that you distinguish an epoxy layer in between the optical class and the colliding material. So we pick this, uh, this epoxy because it exhibits optical and mechanical properties that's intermediate between the glass and the elastic substrate. So by doing so, our simulations have shown that this kind of intermediate layer can effectively release a lot of thermal stress that's generated during processing, and this allows us to monolithically integrate these photonic structures directly on top of our elastomer subject. Now in addition, the other challenge here is that we need to actually transform these rigid materials into something that's bendable and stretchable. The inspiration actually comes from this uh, helical spring here. So if you look at them, they are made of steel, which is completely stiff in the bulk form. But with proper geometric structuring, they can be made into highly stretchable form. So what we want to do here is actually to make this kind of photonic springs. So we actually construct this serpentine waveguides. And what our mechanical simulation has shown is that by doing this kind of geometric structuring, these structures, when they are stretched, they can undergo both in-plane and out-of-plane deformation. And they absorb most of the strain that actually exerts on these uh, devices. Now, in addition, if you want to construct photonic circuits, there are also some photonic devices that you actually do not want to deform. So one example here would be these grating couplers. So these actually use optical diffractive gratings to couple light from the optical fiber into our home chip circuit. Now, the operation wavelength of these gratings is dictated by the period of the gratings. So if you change these gratings and change the period, you're going to change the operation wavelengths, and they will destabilize the performance of the circuits. So to mitigate this kind of undesirable deformation, we actually place this critical circuit elements onto a locally stiffened substrate. And by doing so, we can minimize any undesired deformation of this component. So this will be kind of our mechanical scheme that we use to actually construct this uh, highly deformable photonic circuits. So to fabricate these device structures, the uh, strategy we use is we start with a rigid silicon handle wafer. We coat it with the polymer coatings that serve as the flexible substrates. We then fabricate all these photonic devices using standard nanofabrication technology, like lithography etching. And then in the very end, we would delaminate these flexible structures from the substrate to get freestanding photonic circuits. So what I want to emphasize here is that this process, all the way up to the second last step, everything is fabricated right on silicon. So we can fully leverage standard silicon microfabrication facilities to fabricate such emerging structures. Now, in terms of performance, these devices are really highly conformable, uh, highly deformable, and also uh, mechanically robust. So you can actually stretch these devices with over 40% elongation. You can also bend them down to really small bending radius, like 0.2 millimeters, and you can repeat such vigorous uh, deformation by like hundreds of thousands of cycles and we basically see no change in terms of optical performance. So what I'm showing you here is that we can actually make these individual devices with very high uh, performance. Now, next I'll show you that how we can actually put these devices together to form a functional photonic circuit. <coughs> so in this slide, I'm giving you the basic process flow we use to construct these active passive integrated circuits. So specifically, um, this process is pretty similar to what I've already shown you. We still use the handler silicon substrate, but we add a few steps here where we actually attach a semiconductor nanomembrane onto this flexible substrate. So this semiconductor nanomembrane has a thickness in the order of less than 200 nanometers. So at that kind of small thickness, these semiconductors also become highly flexible, and it also maintains all the nice optoelectronic properties in their bulk form. So by putting these things together, we can actually construct photonic circuits that combines both active and passive components. And most specifically, I'll give you one example here, 
where we actually integrate photon detectors with the photonic waveguide network to create a flexible detectors. Now, let me mention that flexible detector is not something new. There are actually a lot of paper talking about that. But what's unique about our design is that our detectors are integrated with the optical waveguide network. Now, this does actually a few good things, yeah? So, because we use optical waveguide, that's actually very small with the sub-wavelength dimension. And this actually enhances the coupling efficiency while we can use actually a much smaller photo detector element. So, I'll show you a little animation here. Let's see how it plays right. Okay. And what this animation shows to you is that we're actually launching optical pulse from the left-hand side. It's guided by the waveguide and then down into this uh, photo detector here. And what you see is that this pulse quickly gets absorbed by the detector and convert it into an electron current. Okay. So the advantage of using such a waveguide coupled design is that we can use very small detector elements and they actually contribute to enhance speed of the detectors. Because it takes very little time for electrons to travel from one electrode to another. It improves the signal-to-noise ratio because the small active volume suppresses most of the noise source. And then also, it gives us a very good dynamic range because this improves the optical coupling. So, to verify that indeed we get this enhanced performance, we actually perform all these different measurements. So in this plot here, I give you the uh, current bias curve when the detector is in dark versus illuminated by light from the waveguides. And we demonstrate that this detector can actually respond to a wide dynamic range of over 60 dB with a very respectable responsivity of 0.35 amperes per watt. We also measure the speed of the detectors. They exhibit a 3 dB bandwidth of 1.8 gigahertz. And this also represents actually the fastest flexible detector that has ever been reported. In terms of mechanical properties, you can actually bend these devices down to a very small bending radius, some millimeter, and you can repeat these bending cycles by thousands and hundreds of times. And in this case, I'm showing that the dark current of the device does not change, meaning the material is not getting degraded. And also, optical response also shows no change, despite this uh, mechanical deformation. So to put this result into context, I want to mention that in the flexible electronics community, there's this kind of test called the pencil test. So the idea is if you can wrap your device around a pencil and it doesn't, doesn't destroy the device, this means that you actually get a pretty flexible device. It's usually considered a pretty tough test. Okay? So our devices certainly exceed all these current standards. Now, up to this point, I hope I've convinced you that we can actually construct photonic devices and even functional circuit elements using a, on a flexible substrate that exhibits superior mechanical and optical performance. Now, let me come back to the theme today here, that what would this technology enable in terms of emerging sensing applications? So for that, let me ask this question here. So how many of you have actually got an Apple Watch? Hands up, please. So some of you, not a lot. So either you are all too shy, or Apple has a lot of more work to do in terms of marketing here. <laughs> so my wife actually get one of these Apple Watch. It's a pretty nice product. It also gets this nice function that you can actually monitor your heart rate. Okay? But there's a similar limitation here. In order for this Apple Watch heart rate monitor to function normally, you need to keep F3 still. You cannot be moving. Okay? Now, that's pretty bad because most of the time, when you actually want to monitor heart rate is when you're actually doing physical exercise. Right? But at that time, you won't be able to get an accurate rating out of Apple Watch. And this is known as motion artifact. Here. Now, to see why that comes in, we have to look at the sensing mode here. It's called photoplasticography, or PPG. Okay? So in your PPG sensor, you basically have a little LED that shines light onto your skin. It's going to get reflected. In the reflected signal, it's going to carry an AC signal that corresponds to the pulsating or the heartbeat rate. Okay? Then you use a photo detector to actually analyze the signal and get the information you need. So sometimes when you visit doctors, they may give you this kind of clip-like thing to put on your finger to measure your blood oxygen and heart rate. That's actually a PPG sensor. Okay? Now the problem there is that with this wearable PPGs, because you're illuminating uh, LED light onto your skin, and if you're moving, the illumination spot is actually not constant. So you get this changing of illumination, and due to the moderation of skin properties, you won't be able to get a reliable reading. There are also other drawbacks here. This kind of device is also very sensitive to ambient light. Okay. It also exhibits a poor signal to noise ratio because you are actually not just illuminating one single vessel, right? You're collecting signal from this wide region here that actually dilute your useful signal. So what our technology can actually enable is this kind of flexible conformal sensor that solves all these problems I had mentioned about. So first of all, because we have flexible devices, we can conformally integrate it on human skin, and this immediately eliminates all these motion artifacts. 
In addition, I won't go into the details here, but we have developed optical designs that actually allow us to suppress completely any ambient light interference. And we are also actually able to actually perform not just a single spot interrogation, but perform imaging applications on the skin or spectroscopic interrogation, such that we can collect a lot more information compared to a conventional PPG test. Now, I want to mention here that if you want to show me to show this product today, I won't be, it won't be available yet, because this is still ongoing research. But what we do believe is that upon completion of this project, we'll be able to move a step closer to the holy grail for continuous, non-invasive, and artifact-free uh, physiological uh, sensors. So with that, I want to conclude my talk, and I want to thank all the group members and my collaborators who actually enabled all this research, and I also want to thank the funding agencies for supporting the research. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Angie.